I've been assigned uh, uh, an important and a wonderful subject, simultaneously righteous and sinful. And this is probably going to be a little bit more like a, a theological lesson than a typical sermon because I, I want to do all that I can to help you understand how important this is. But I want to begin with the story of, uh, of Lazarus, if I may. Lazarus, you remember, had been dead for four days. And uh, the Lord arrived at his grave. He had uh, purposely delayed his coming to Bethany to make sure that Lazarus was good and dead. And there was kind of a, I guess, a kind of a floating uh, urban legend in Judaism that after four days, the spirit of a body stopped hovering over the body and, and departed for good. Maybe Jesus accommodated that legend a little bit. Mary and Martha believed that if Jesus had shown up before Lazarus died, he wouldn't have died because Jesus had the power to raise him from the dead. They weren't convinced that, I mean, power to heal him. They weren't convinced that he had the power to raise him from the dead. But Jesus purposely waited to arrive until the four days had gone by to give display to the full scope of his power. He went to Lazarus grave and told the mourners to remove the stone, which no doubt called, caused no small disturbance. And then, one of my favorite Bible verses, I remember as a kid memorizing this along with memorizing a lot of verses, but I think this was the favorite verse that I memorized as a kid. Martha blurts out, Lord, by this time he stinketh in classic King James English. John eleven thirty nine. 39, you probably didn't memorize that verse, but I found all kinds of uses for that verse. Um, the stench would have been severe. The Jews did not embalm. And so all they did was basically put some elements, some components on the top of the body, topically, didn't do anything really to eliminate the smell. It would have been very embarrassing to open that grave and to have that smell come out. Jesus, however, ignored her concern, cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And years ago I read a commentator who said it's a good thing he qualified Lazarus or all the graves in the world would have emptied on the spot. (laughs) Because certainly from John 5 he had the power to raise the dead, all the dead. The sight of the mourners when they saw Lazarus is recorded in Scripture. It says, he was bound hand and foot with wrappings and his face was wrapped with a cloth. He basically, I think, came out of the grave like a hopping mummy and stood there where people could see him. And then Jesus says that famous line, loose him and let him go. As long as the stinking grave clothes filled with the decay and stench of death clung to Lazarus, he did stink. And he was unable to fully express his new life. In a very real sense, I think this is a graphic analogy of our predicament as regenerate Christians. We have been raised from the dead. We have been raised to new life. We, however, are still stuck with the remnants of our previous existence. We have been raised, but we stink. So that's the title of my message. (laughs) We have been raised, but we stink. That's the reality of our spiritual condition. However, there's a, actually a deeper problem than Lazarus had. Lazarus' mummy rags were readily disposed of. It was, after all, just a linen shroud, 
And once it was removed, the stench of the corruption of death no longer clung to Lazarus. Our predicament cannot be resolved so quickly, and it cannot be resolved so easily. Why? Because it is not just a shroud that clings to us superficially. It is a full-fledged dead carcass strapped to us. Paul calls it in Romans 7, verse 24, the body of this death. It is the presence of sin that remains in us, in our mortal flesh. We live, and yet the stench of death is not just on us, but all through us. That is why Romans 8, 23 says, we wait for the redemption of the body. We wait for the deliverance from this body of death. You say, well, what has happened to us when we were saved then? And the answer to that, if you'll look in your Bible, comes from Romans 6. And we're going to look a little bit at Romans 6 and 7. So much is here, we can't cover all of it, but just to touch some things that are stated in the sixth chapter of Romans. For example, verses five and six, if we have become united with him, that is Christ, in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. That simply says, we're not who we used to be. Our old self crucified, our old self is dead. And what is the effect of that? Our body of sin is done away. That that entity that we once were is gone. We, as a result of that, are no longer slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. If you were a slave to somebody and you died, you were no longer that person's slave. That's the simple analogy. We have been freed then from slavery to sin. Freed from the domination of sin. Sin's mastery has been broken. It is not to say that sin is no longer present. It is to say it no longer rules. It no longer has dominion. Follow down to verse 11. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Very strong language but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We're like Lazarus. We were dead. We are now alive. You see it again in verse 14. Sin shall not be master over you. You see it again in verse 17. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that schema, that form of teaching to which you were committed. As a result, having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. This is a real change. This is a true transformation. And then verse 22, now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. Now these verses are telling us that what actually happened was a real death, that there was an entity in existence that is no longer in existence. This is a real transformation. I grew up hearing that salvation was addition, that you were an old man and an old nature, and when you became a believer, you got a new nature added to your old nature. And um, people used to illustrate it by saying, the old nature is the black dog, the new nature is the white dog, and who wins whoever you say sick them to. that you are what you were and salvation added something. That is not the language of the New Testament. It is not addition, it is transformation. And the language cannot be stronger. It is death and life. It is the death of an entity and the creation of a new entity by the power of God. In fact, it is so dramatic that the change in you at your salvation was greater than the change in you will be at your death. You have already had the creation of a new 
entity which is fit for heaven. So that death for you is subtraction. You simply drop your unredeemed humanness. The dramatic, total, utter transformation in the language of death and life occurred at your salvation. Now the question has to be asked at this juncture, when Paul says all of this, sin shall not be master over you, you're no longer the slave of sin, consider yourself alive unto God and dead to sin, is he saying that though sin is not master over us, is it possible that we can become total masters over sin? Can we actually achieve sinlessness? Is that the goal? Is that the objective? I recently read this from a national ministry, a quote, no limit can be put on the degree of perfection attainable in this life. Doing so would be to limit the grace of God. Clearly the only limitation as to how holy you can be is that which you impose by your own free will. So, scrunch up your own free will and become perfect. That's the message. This is called by many entire sanctification. That's a technical term. Let me read you from the Church of the Nazarene. This isn't the Church of the Nazarene, is it? I don't want the roof to come in here. The Church of the Nazarene Articles of Faith. This is in the Articles of Faith faith of the Church of the Nazarene. We believe that entire sanctification is that act of God somehow, based on our free will, I might add, that act of God subsequent to regeneration by which believers are made free from original sin or depravity. Next time you pass a Nazarene church, think about that. Entire sanctification is that act of God subsequent to regeneration by which believers are made free from original sin or depravity and brought into a state of entire devotion to God and the holy obedience of love made perfect. It is wrought by the baptism with the Holy Spirit and comprehends in one experience the cleansing of the heart from sin and the abiding indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit empowering the believer for life and service. Entire sanctification is wrought instantaneously by faith, preceded by entire consecration. This experience is also known by various terms representing its different phases such as Christian perfection, perfect love, heart purity, the fullness of the blessing, and Christian holiness. We believe that there is a marked distinction between a pure heart and a mature character. The former is obtained in an instant, the result of entire sanctification, the latter is the result of growth in grace. So you can be immature and entirely sanctified in their view. Let me just follow this a little more so that I can clarify this particular position. It is the idea that subsequent to your salvation, you can attain in a moment, instantaneously, by an act of your own free will through faith, entire sanctification so as to completely obliterate the reality of total depravity. It is an experience, it is not progressive, It is not like maturing, it is an instantaneous experience. If you trace this back, you will find, for example, Martin Luther confronting it and calling it a false philosophy of Aristotle adapted by medieval scholastics. Luther said this, they teach that sin is entirely destroyed by baptism or repentance and so regard it as absurd that the apostle should confess sin dwells in me. As a converted or spiritual man, they say, 
he could no longer have any sin in him. Therefore, they argue, he here speaks of himself as an unconverted man. So way back in the day of Luther, there were those who were teaching what became known as perfectionism or some form of entire sanctification. B.B. Warfield, uh, who has helped us so much in the foundations of our understanding of many elements of Reformed theology and had a great influence on me when I was in seminary, B.B. Warfield has written a great work called Perfectionism, and if you want a lot of the history of perfectionism, which is another term for entire sanctification, he would be the one uh, initially to read. He traces the modern influence back to John Wesley, of course. It was John Wesley, says Warfield, who injected and infected the Protestant world with this idea of entire sanctification, that a believer can reach a point in this life because of an instantaneous willed faith experience where depravity is canceled out and he's entirely sanctified or reaches Christian perfection. Quoting Warfield, he says of John Wesley, there was no element of Wesley's teaching which afforded him greater satisfaction than this. There is no element of Wesley's teaching which is more lauded by his followers. This was a huge component of Wesleyan theology. Warfield goes on to show that as wave after wave of this holiness movement has washed up on the shore of the church, for sure it has had various forms, but there is one consistent fundamental, one consistent fundamental. Well, there are a lot of elements to it, but the one consistent fundamental is that this kind of perfectionism and sanctification, and sanctification itself for that matter, is divided from justification. The essential core of this notion that repeats itself in diverse movements is that justification and sanctification are divided from one another, are two separate gifts of God which we appropriate momentarily, instantaneously by a faith experience. Their view is sanctification is obtained the same way justification is obtained, by a simple act of faith and not the same act as justification, but a new and later act, optional, but very, very desirable. Sanctification, in their view, is the second work of grace. Have you heard that? The second work of grace. And of course, since you can lose it, just like you can lose your salvation, it could be the third and the fourth and the 50th, but it is immediate and it is complete when it happens. They also say sanctification brings complete freedom from sins. And you ask, how in the world do they get away with that? They downgrade the definition of sin. For them, sins are those which are premeditated, intentional, and conscious. Now, when you have achieved this sanctification separate from justification, also by an act, an act of free will faith, you have to be told that it is not a stable reality. Consistent with their Arminianism, like salvation, it is an instable reality. It comes momentarily and it must be maintained. So the way it works is you're only free from sin if you're free from sin. If you're not free from sin, you're not free from sin. It must be maintained or it will be lost. It often is lost, but it may be instantaneously recovered by another act of faith. How many of you ladies uh, use Oneida flatware in your kitchen? You ever seen that little Oneida? Anybody use that stuff? Oneida? You know, it's a brand. You ever seen it? Look on the back of your tableware. Huge flatware company. You say, this is an odd transition. Well, that's all right, stick with me here for a minute. <laughs> it's early. <laughs> I'm leaving out some of the transitional statements. Can you understand that? <laughs> Oneida is a flatware company as far as you know. But its real history is Oneida was one of the best known of about 50 utopian communes that operated in New York State after the ministry, if you want to call it that, of Charles Finney. 
Oneida was a commune made up of 300 perfectionists. There was a man by the name of Henry Noyes who was a follower of Charles Finney. We're talking 1849 to 1879, a 30 year period of this Oneida commune. There were 300 of the people in the Oneida commune. Uh, They followed the Arminianism of Finney and they came to this conviction of perfectionism. They started the flatware company that still operates today. What very few knew and what was not discovered until 1879 was that this perfectionist community, this perfectionist commune that had reached entire sanctification, perfect love, Christian perfection, practiced communal marriage. All 300 of them were available to each other. And as soon as children reached puberty, they were injected into the orgy. Every woman was available to every man starting young. And yet they were a Christian perfectionist community. That requires some redefinition of sin. And while admittedly that is a bizarre illustration, it's a good one to use because you're familiar with the name, they had figured out a way to live in a perpetual orgy and still be entirely sanctified. I'm surprised it doesn't come back today because that would be a popular group. And while that's a bizarre illustration of perfectionism, in every case the advocates of perfectionism have to downgrade sin to some degree. They're forced to downgrade sin. They're forced to redefine sin. They're forced to redefine holiness to accommodate reality. To accommodate reality. And today, Methodists, Old Line Methodists, Salvation Army, Nazarene Church, other Wesleyan groups, Pentecostals, Charismatics, affirm entire sanctification, even calling it by the name eradication, because they believe that there is the possibility of the eradication of original sin. Sin then becomes only what is premeditated, only what is conscious, only what is intentional, and only what the given culture defines as sin. Unconscious, unintentional, bad acts are labeled mistakes, and some actually just label them temptations. Obviously, every perfectionist comes face to face with clear, and abundant evidence that sin resides in and troubles the most devout Christian. They're not kidding me, and they're not really kidding themselves. So to hang on to this idea, you have to redefine holiness, you have to redefine sin, and you also wind up torturing your own conscience. Torturing your own conscience. You say, well, I'm not in that movement, and I'm pretty far from that movement. Here I am at a Reformed conference. You probably aren't really far from this movement. I grew up with the trappings from this movement in my life. There have been modifications of this movement that have found their way basically into the fabric of evangelicalism in this country. In fact, it highly defined it. I grew up as a kid in a church, Baptist church. Every time we had a youth meeting, we were asked to come forward and rededicate our lives. Sound familiar? You ever go to camp? And if you wanna rededicate your life, you took a pine cone and threw it in the fire? or a stick and they call it a faggot service. They don't call it that anymore. (laughs) Fortunately. 
I remember going to camp one time and the speaker was whipping us up trying to get us to come to the second level. He's trying to catapult us by emotion to this level where we would rededicate, reconsecrate. And we were very emotional. I, I had tears coming down my eyes. I was just trying to figure out what, what that meant and what do I do. And I remember the kid next to me was just having a real struggle and you're supposed to go up and get a pine cone and throw it in the fire. And he walked up to the front and they waited for you to walk and maybe say a word and this kid walked up and took off his watch and threw it in the fire. His watch. He said, I want to dedicate my time to God. <laughs> what? <laughs> How are you going to do that if you don't know what time it is? <laughs> it's pretty basic. <laughs> was this kid was raised to some level of emotion. I trekked up there with my pine cone. You know, and then when you'd go home, the youth pastor would always say to you, no, we want you to be able to hold on to the mountaintop experience. You ever hear that kind of talk? Yeah, we all kind of grew up in that stuff. In my early years at Grace, this actually happened at the church. At the end of a service, and I told people to consider their relationship to Christ at the end of a message, and a lady started down the main aisle of the church with a dog a dog dressed in a little red sweater, a, a lady's dog. <laughs> and when she got to the front, I had come down and I said, may I help you, ma'am? And she said, no, it's fine. We're going to the prayer room. My dog just rededicated his life. <laughs> what? That actually happened. I really didn't know what to say. People get very attached to their dogs. And obviously, she was a few bricks short of a full load. But it just was sort of like a metaphor for that whole crazy idea that in some moment of time, you can catapult yourself into some other zone spiritually. Can I tell you this? This is close to all of us because this is also a core teaching in the no lordship salvation movement. This is what that movement is about. That you can have Jesus as savior and maybe later get around to him being Lord. I used to hear that as a kid growing up. Make Jesus Lord of your life. Make Jesus Lord of your life. I finally figured out I can't make him Lord. That's not my responsibility. I don't have the power or the right to do that. He is Lord. But that's what we heard growing up. Make Jesus Lord. He's your Savior. Make him Lord. I went one time to Moody Bible Institute, and I, I, I preached for a week years ago. We used to have Founders Week, and they'd have a, several of us speak. One guy would have the 10 o'clock session. One guy would have the 11 o'clock session. And another guy would have the 2 o'clock session, and then we'd rotate at night. So there were like three speakers. I was giving a series on biblical sanctification in the early hour, and in the next hour, one of the no lordship teachers was there basically saying, don't worry about the second blessing yet. Don't worry about making Jesus Lord. He actually said, I have this quote, don't even worry about that till you're eh, 30 or 35 years old. It's enough that he's your savior now. Later on, you can Make him Lord. So this is, this is close to us. This kind of teaching permeates. Every time you go to a church, I went to a, a meeting one time in Canada and, and they started talking about revival. It descends into this. Trying to whip people up who are Christians to get revived and come to the front and re-consecrate, re-dedicate, become revived. This, this basically is Wesleyan perfectionism in its many forms, running from that kind of experience all the way to the Oneida community and everything in between. In the books that I've written on the lordship issue, I'm really dealing with this very idea. If you want some good help on this, Go get a classic standard J.C. Ryle book on holiness. 
In that book written in 1879, Ryle says, sudden instantaneous leaps from conversion to consecration I fail to see in the Bible. <laughs> of course you fail to see them in the Bible. They are not there. He knew what all accurate theologians know. The justification and sanctification are inseparable. They both come at salvation. Justification is instantaneous. Sanctification begins and is progressive. And there are no leaps into some other category of eradication or perfection. This is, by the way, a serious and consequential error. It's been around a long time, and as I said, it just permeates our contemporary evangelicalism. And if you're trying to operate in this matter of sanctification with a false paradigm, you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. You're chasing the wrong thing down the wrong path. If you think the way to be holy is to chase the demons out of your life, that's a wrong paradigm. If you think the, the way to be holy is to speak in tongues, that's a wrong paradigm. If you think the way to be holy is to have some kind of a rededication experience that catapults you to another level, that's a wrong paradigm. It is a serious and consequential error. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Verse 30, Paul says, by his doing, by sovereign grace, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness, that's justification, and sanctification. All at once, all at the same time. In the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians and the 11th verse, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. You can't separate sanctification from justification. At the time, at the moment of our justification, we were set apart from sin. The old is dead, the new lives and progresses in holy development to glorification. It probably would be helpful, I hope it would be helpful to think about justification and sanctification a little bit because I think this is so essential. Similarities, here's a few similarities. Both originate and stem from the free grace of God, both. It is only because of His grace that believers are justified and sanctified, fully the work of grace. Secondly, both are part of Christ's redemptive work of salvation. He is the source of our pardon in justification and our purification in sanctification. Thirdly, both will be present in the same persons so that anyone who is justified will also be being sanctified and anyone who is being sanctified has been justified. Fourthly, both begin simultaneously. The moment of justification is the moment that sanctification begins. Fifthly, both are necessary to glorification. Those who reach heaven have not only been forgiven of their sins, they have also been given new life. Now there are some differences. Here's a few. In justification, the sinner is counted righteous because the righteousness of Christ is imputed to him. We know that. In sanctification, the sinner is actually being made righteous, though to a limited degree, through the work of the Spirit. A second, the righteousness of justification is not our own. It is Christ's. The righteousness of sanctification is our own, wrought in us through the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, our own works play no part in justification. Our works play an important part in sanctification, for God commands us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Fourthly, justification is an instantaneous and finished work, totally complete the moment the sinner 
believes sanctification is an imperfect work lasting for the rest of his life, not complete until glorification. And finally, justification does not increase, does not develop, does not grow. The sinner is as justified at the moment of conversion as he will be in eternity. But sanctification is progressive as believers grow in their spiritual walk until glorification. And if you understand the true doctrine of justification and sanctification, you can just dismiss all this perfectionism. So many hymns that we sing, people who are perfectionists can't sing. We sang one this morning. Talked about our sinfulness, our wretchedness. Thomas Watson wrote this, saving faith lives in a broken heart, always grows in a heart humbled by sin, in a weeping eye and a tearful conscience. In other words, if you're really being sanctified, you are more and more and more aware of your sin. Young people come to me at the Master's College all the time and they ask questions, and it's just it's such a joy to work with these kids. And one of the common questions that you get, because you know, there are all kinds of temptations running at warp speed among our young people, is they call me, well, I probably shouldn't tell you what they call me, but they call me Johnny Mac. <laughs> the kids, and I love it. I mean, I'm, I love it. So, hey, Johnny Mac, can, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, will I ever, will I ever gain victory over sin and temptation? You, you're older than me. Tell me. And my answer is this. Yes. Yes. As you grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ, as the Word does its work, as the Spirit does its work, and your sanctification increases, and you are being changed by the Spirit of God into the image of Christ as you gaze at His glory, yes, you will gain victory over sin. You'll have increasing victory and decreasing iniquity. Yes, yes, you will be better. However, you will feel worse. What? That's right. Because part of being better is hating sin more. So if you're honest about your sanctification, you're not going to announce, I uh, had an experience the other day and I've arrived at eradication. <laughs> First of all, I don't believe that. Secondly, you don't believe it. And that's why I say it's, it's the fast track to a tortured conscience. You don't even know how to define yourself. You're playing mind games. It's bad enough that you could lose your salvation. On top of that, you can lose your sanctification. This is chaos. And yet it's a dominant idea in the church. What does Scripture say? Proverbs 20, verse 9, who can say I have cleansed my heart? Who can say I am pure from my sin? Rhetorical question to which the answer is, no one. Or 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. It's pretty serious. Or James 3, 2, we all stumble in many ways. Or Galatians 5, 17, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things you wish. You say, well, Paul was a mature Christian. If anybody was entirely sanctified, he must have been entirely sanctified. If anybody had the sin uh, nature or depravity eradicated, he must have had it eradicated. No, he's talking about himself there. He's talking about himself. In fact, we know that. Turn to Romans 7, because here's his testimony. And this is really the definitive way to look at a believer who is mature, who is progressively being sanctified, 
who, who gives this testimony, and listen to this testimony. Here are, before we look at Romans 7, you can be turning to it, but do you remember Paul's words? It is a trustworthy statement and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. This is a man who in his maturity, at the very end of his life, the godliest of men says, I am, not was, the chief sinner. And this is what I was saying earlier. You sin less and feel worse because the the more intimately you know God, the more you hate the sin that is in you. The same man who said he was the chief sinner says in 2 Corinthians 1.12, our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. And you say, are you kidding? The same person said, I'm the chief of sinner, and on the other hand says, my conscience doesn't accuse me because I've lived in godliness and sincerity. What is that? That's being simultaneously righteous and sinful. He could say, I am the chief of sinners, and yet my conscience is clear because I deal with the sin. Now look at Romans 7, 14. You just need to kind of follow the flow here. We know that the law is spiritual. I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. Didn't he just say in chapter 6 that he was delivered from slavery to sin? What is this? Well, he's going to have to clarify that because it sounds like he's saying the opposite. For that which I am doing, I do not understand. I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. This is the dilemma. I don't do what I want to do. I do what I don't want to do. Verse 16, I do the very thing I don't wish to do. But verse 17, very important. So now, how am I to describe this? It is no longer I doing it. This is a very, very important statement. I don't do what I want to do. I do what I do not want to do. I, I love the law of God. It is holy, just, and good, he said. I concur with the law of God. I wind up doing the very thing I don't want to do agreeing with the law, confessing that it's good. So he says, it's no longer I doing it. It's not the new ego. It's not the new man. It's not the new creation. But it is sin which indwells me. He is saying, I came alive. I came out of the grave. The old man is dead. The old self is dead. I live, but I stink. I am permeated with the stench of death. And he keeps circling back the same truth again. I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, my unredeemed humanness, the part of me that has not yet been recreated. The wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish I do not do, but I practice the very evil I do not wish. If I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it. Now, this is the second time he said that. I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it, and yet I'm doing it. He separates an entity in him. It is not the new I. It is not that I which is crucified with Christ and now lives. It is not the new creation because God cannot create something out of his hands sinful. So the new I, the new life, the new man that is in me is free from sin. But sin is still present. It still resides, and he says this, Specifically, in my flesh. In my flesh. Verse 20, I'm doing the very thing I do not wish. I'm no longer the one doing it. Sin dwells in me. I find then 
the principle, evil is present in me. He separates the evil that is there residing, remaining from who he is. He is the one who loves the law of God. He is the one who wishes to do good. He joyfully concurs with the law of God in his inner man. The inner man is the new creation. But there's a different principle. There's another principle in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. He's very careful to say that the new man is holy, the new man loves what is good, the new man created by God, so clearly defined in the sixth chapter, longs to do the right thing, can only do the right thing, but it's permeated by the flesh, by the body, by members. This is not just physical body. The flesh encompasses all our humanness, mind, will, emotions, actions. But Paul makes a distinction. He knows that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. He knows that he has been born of God, in the words of Peter, with an incorruptible seed. That that new man is so free from sin that it will live forever. It will live forever. You're, you're not going to go through another death and resurrection spiritually to get into heaven. That's already been done. The old life, the old man, the old self was not partially sinful, not mostly sinful, but totally sinful, had absolutely no righteousness and no potential for righteousness, so it had to die. At salvation it died, God killed it, and God created a new life, a new entity that is sinless, holy, righteous, and eternal. It is beyond sin's reach, it is pure, it is ready for heaven, for God's presence. Salvation again is transformation, not addition. But why do we go on sinning? Because of this remaining flesh. That's why we groan waiting for the redemption of our bodies. When I think about heaven, I don't think about streets that are transparent gold. That's kind of that's interesting. Um, I like to see gates made out of one pearl and jeweled features, but what appeals to me about heaven is the absence of sin. I mean, I've been at this a long time. It gets old. Living with me gets old. But it's not, it's not the new creation. It's the sin that's in me. We're like a holy seed in an unholy shell. We're a holy entity incarcerated in unredeemed flesh that affects our body, mind, emotion, will, affections, actions. So what do we do about it? Well, we have to subdue it. This is where the battle rages. And there's no way to catapult yourself into a sin-free zone. Paul says in Romans 6, 12, don't let sin reign. Don't go on presenting the members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness. Or 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I beat my body into subjection so that in preaching to others, I myself don't become disqualified. Romans 7, 24, he sums it up, wretched man that I am, wretched man that I am. That's a very mature statement. If somebody comes along to you and says, um, well, I used to be wretched and now I'm perfect, no, they're, they're more, far more wretched than they understand. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? It was a custom among ancient tyrants when they wished to put men to the most fearful punishments, said Spurgeon, to take the body of the victim they had killed and strap the dead corpse to the killer. Place them back to back. And there was a living man, said Spurgeon, with a dead body strapped to him, rotting, putrid, corrupting. He must drag around the corpse wherever he went until the corpse infected him and took his life. This is what Paul's talking about here. 
we have new life, but we're not just wearing a shroud of sin. We've got the dead corpse strapped to us, and its influence is powerful, powerful. It is, Spurgeon said, death incarnate, death concentrated, death dwelling in the very temple of life. So what do we do about it? What do we do about it? Chapter 8 of Romans and verse 13, he says, if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if you're living according to the Spirit, you are in the process of putting to death the deeds of the body. Believers live. Believers fight the battle. Believers, to use the old language, mortify the flesh. Believers do everything they can to kill the sin that remains. This is the distinctive behavior of true Christians. Not imagining they have no sin, but constantly endeavoring by all the means of grace to mortify the sin that remains. Abstaining from sin. Keeping themselves out of the way of temptation, making no provision for the flesh, fixed on Jesus, walking in the Spirit, meditating on Scripture, praying fervently, as Jesus said, so you don't fall into temptation. It is a lifelong battle you fight daily. And you have to fight it with a passion. I began with an illustration from the New Testament of Lazarus, kind of an analogy. I want to borrow an analogy from the Old Testament to close. Turn to 1 Samuel 15. And by the way, I haven't scratched the surface of all the things that we should understand about this, and I commend to you a careful, thoughtful study of Romans 6 and 7 and get the good material on that to be enriched. Samuel said to Saul in 1 Samuel 15.1, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I'll punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up out of Egypt. You remember the story? They attacked the rear of the Israelites, and they killed the women and the children. It It was a low blow attack and assault. And so God says, go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Wow. Obliterate the Amalekites. Obliterate them. Deal ruthlessly with them. They were vicious, vicious enemies of Israel. Deuteronomy 25 is the story. In fact, God had vowed in Exodus 17 and verse 14 to Moses and said this, I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Because of their wickedness, God called on Saul to do that. Over in verse 7 of that same chapter, look at it. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt, and he captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and weren't willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. They didn't obey God. They spared Agag. They spared Agag and no doubt others. Serious mistake. Serious mistake. Verse 23 says, For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry, because you, Saul, have rejected the word of the Lord. This is coming from the Lord through Samuel. He has rejected you from being king. A failure to destroy the Amalekites cost Saul his throne and any future kings from his line. Go down to verse 32. 
So Samuel said, Bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Sure, he was alive. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. Can't we all just get along? But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, which is exactly what he did to Israel, so shall your mother be childless among women. And here's the Hebrew. Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Whoa. Hacked him to pieces? Yeah. Samuel obeyed God, but didn't get all the Amalekites. Scripture records that a few years later, the reinvigorated Amalekites, who are now even more ticked off than ever at the Israelites, raided the southern region of Israel. This is in the 30th chapter of 1 Samuel. And took all the women and children captive, including some from the family of David. Some from the family of David. In that 30th chapter, David responds, verse 16 and 17, but again, didn't kill all the Amalekites. Five centuries later, a descendant of Agag shows up. His name, Haman, in the book of Esther. What does he want to do? Obliterate the Jews. Say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, it's only an analogy, but I'm telling you, if you don't hack sin to pieces, it's coming back. And it'll come back reinvigorated and sometimes stronger than ever. The sin that remains must be ruthlessly hacked to pieces or it will revive and plunder your heart again. John Owen said, sin is not killed when it is only covered up. Sin is not killed when it is internalized. Sin is not killed when it is exchanged for another sin. Sin is not killed when it is repressed. Sin has only been killed when the conscience has been appeased. It's a lifelong effort with a promise that he who began a good work in us will perfect it in the day of Jesus Christ. Father, what a wonderful thing it is to consider the reality of our spiritual struggle. We need to understand it. There's no point in following some imaginary path we need to know the truth. We need to understand who we are. And my conscience and all our consciences resonate with this. We've been, we've been saved. We've been justified, regenerated, redeemed, ransomed. We've been converted. We've been transformed. We understand that. We've seen all the realities of new life pouring through us. A love of holy things, affections for those things that are pure and good. The love of your word, the love of Christian fellowship, the love of the truth the love of the lost, all these evidences of a transformed soul. But at the same time, we understand we are still, we are still carrying the stench of the death that dominated us in our former lives and we long for the day when we will be redeemed from the body of this corruption and you will loose us and let us go free. Until that time, give us a, a mentality of Samuel to understand that we can't allow the remaining sins that are our enemies to survive. We've got to be willing to take ruthless action against them continually. Thank you, Lord. We can't do this in our own strength, but we are able to do it because you strengthen us through your Spirit. We plead for a pure and clear conscience because sin, though resident, is being killed. Give us that victory, Lord. Daily we pray. For your glory we pray. Amen.